My subject here, of course, is a quick review of inductors, and particularly as they pertain to switching power supplies. Looking at our first slide, you have an electromagnet at the top versus a bar magnet here at the bottom. When a current passes through a coil of wire, in fact, it could just be a straight piece of wire, anytime a current goes through a conductor, it generates a magnetic field around the conductor. When you wind it in a coil, such as you see here, that magnetic field is concentrated. It behaves, basically it's an electromagnet is what we call it, behaves the same way as a permanent magnet except note a couple of things. The magnetic polarity depends on the direction of current flow. And, we, and if the current ceases to flow, your magnetic field collapses and it's back to just being a coil of wire. In this case, we got to determine the magnetic polarity of an electromagnet. You'll do the following. Take the coil, assume it's wound on a form of some kind, in your right hand. And position your thumb as shown here. Observe the direction in which the coil is wound. Connect this side to the positive, this side to the negative your thumb will point to the North Pole. Uh, we used to have something similar called the left hand rule, but since we're using, in this case, uh, conventional current and not electron flow, you would use the right hand rule. Here's a typical example of inductors we would use in switching power supplies. Again, it's just a copper, it's a winding of copper wire. These are toroid coil, uh, cores called toroids. And the inductance produced in a typical toroid depends on the number of turns and the core material. Sometimes these are used to suppress noise from switching circuits. This type here you'll commonly find in a switching power supply. This is more of a PC mount. It probably has an iron core, and this certainly has a ferrite or iron core. Most of these coils do have ferrite. That's an artificial man-made material, as opposed to, say, straight iron or steel. Here they come in all sorts of forms. These you see up here. That's, they have two pins in and two pins out. They are used in the power supply side of switching power supplies to keep noise from the switching circuits being fed into the power line and creating radio emissions and so forth. Then here's various forms of just straight inductors, two lead inductors. And again, the value of the inductor depends on the number of turns and the core material. Here's a typical toroid used in a switching power supply. Also notice this down here. This is a potted coil. This is another coil. It'll usually have a part number. 99% of the time, the value of the coil is not actually marked on them. And also, when you're doing switching power supplies, you're also going to find filter caps, like this here and this here, being used with it. All right, let's note first, before we go on, when you apply a voltage to an inductor, the voltage, of course, across the inductor is immediate, goes to full voltage, but there is a delay called back EMF, that doesn't allow, it takes a, a while before the current comes up to max. Remember when you put a current through a magnetic, I mean through an inductor, you generate a magnetic field. Generating that magnetic field suppresses the current flow as energy from the, as energy is absorbed into that magnetic field. And then once it rises to a certain point, where the magnetic field is no longer expanding, it levels off and reaches max, as you can see down here. When the voltage is removed, what happens 
is the current immediately drops to zero. Goes from max to zero, boom, just like that. But in the case of the, when the magnetic field is collapsing, it generates a pulse, or what I call spike. That's the opposite current and voltage polarity of what created it. And it can that spike or pulse can be considerably higher than the voltage that you use to create it to begin with. So if this is 10 volts, you could end up with a 40 volt spike, depending on the value of, of the inductor, the number of turns, and so forth in the coil. Let's look at this slide. In this case, I have a DC source, a battery, uh, on-off switch that's closed, and it creates a current path through this iron core inductor as illustrated here. I get a current flow from plus to minus, and largely going by our right-hand rule that I discussed earlier, this end, for argument's sake, is going to be the North Pole. That end is going to be the South Pole. These arrows here illustrate the expansion of the magnetic field all around the coil. Remember the first slide, how that magnetic field really is really all the way around it. But for this, I'm just showing a small section, but it actually covers the entire coil. So right now, with the switch closed and the magnetic field at max, it does nothing further. Now I open the switch. As I mentioned before, the, the current flow through the inductor goes to zero immediately. And the magnetic field collapses. And I mean a hard, quick collapse. This is no delay in this. That magnetic field slam cuts across the windings in the inductor. Property of induced voltages is that the polarity and current direction are the opposite of what created them. So this time the polarity has been reversed and I've got a current flow assuming it had somewhere to go. In this case it probably arced across the switch contacts but you reverse the current flow, reverse the magnetic polarity from what created it. This is something I do to sort of terrorize my electrical and electronic students into understanding what induced voltages really are. So what do we got here? This is a um, step-down transformer, but I'm hooking a DC source to the primary. I'm not connecting the secondary. Just leave it open. This is an NE2 lamp. It's basically a little glass tube with two pins and it's filled with neon gas. And to fire it, you need 90 volts. These are used as indicators and equipment panels and stuff for 120 or 240 volts or whatever. And I have a switch, I have a 6 volt battery, and I close the switch. So I have a current flowing through the um, primary generates a magnetic field that's actually stored within that, concentrated within that. This has a laminated steel core. I'm not going into transformers as such, but this is not ferrite. This is a laminated steel core. The reason transformers do that is to prevent losses from things like eddy currents and mag other magnetic problems. But the switch is closed, current's flowing, plus to minus, nothing happens. All right, I open the switch, and the magnetic field, again, collapses, and it collapses hard and fast, inducing a high voltage up to 200 volts or more, much higher than the 6 volts that created it. It could be up to 200 volts opposite polarity and instead of arcing across the switch contacts it discharges through the NE2 lamp producing a bright orange purple brief flash. 
Where I have lots of fun with this is I use the students for the NE2 lamp. So they're sitting here holding on to it, and when I open the switch, they get a brief, nice electrical shock. Wakes them up real fast, and it gives them, a, and, and it sort of enforces the idea, you you can get shocked easily on 6 volts. I always make that bet with them, and I always win. But the idea is that I, cre I induced a much higher voltage in the coil from a low voltage um, source. If you actually took this thing and reversed it where I had the uh, secondary connected to the 6 volt battery or 12 volt battery and switched it on and off, on and off, on and off, it would produce a high voltage square wave out of the primary, out of the primary, if, it, if that is if this transformer was switched I would be you can use pulsating DC as in opening and closing a switch and that's usually done with transistors to produce a say 12 volt to guess what 120 volt inverter but nonetheless the magnetic field that was created when it collapsed it induced a high voltage output from the transformer here you're going to see the old style, what we call the um, point condenser ignition system that was used in cars years back. Today we don't use points, we use electronic switching, but it works the same. But in this case, when the points close, a current will flow through the primary of this transformer. And that's what your coil is, it generates your spark, it's a transformer. And it's a very high inductance value on the secondary side. N2 is far, far, far greater than N1, the primary side. And what happens is when the points open, that magnetic field again collapses. But it cuts across those thousands of turns in the secondary, creating a very high voltage spike, which when fired across your spark plugs, ignites your gasoline and fires the cylinder. So that's how that works. The reason the capacitor is used across the point is to keep the arcing. As remember I told you in the other slide when you open the switch you can get an arc across the contacts. This helps suppress that arc so the contacts don't burn out after 10 miles down the road. But for decades, that's how your ignition worked until probably the 70s when they started introducing large-scale solid-state ignition. And so that completes this brief review of um, inductors as they would be used in switching regular. We use this idea of, of storing energy in a coil with a switching regulator and then using that energy upon collapse to charge a capacitor. But nonetheless, this idea was, this concludes just a brief idea of these inductive principles and check out the other related videos on switching regulators at my website at www.bristolwatch.com. Thanks.